All right, right now, I am in Louisville, Kentucky. Not Louisville, not Louisville, but Louisville, Kentucky. And uh, we're getting ready to go into this big old building right here in what I would say for a couple of days becomes the largest history museum in the United States. Uh, and this is one where you can actually buy some of the artifacts. Uh, we are getting ready to go into the annual show of shows. All right, we uh, just got into the show here. I'm pointing this camera at myself like a moron and embarrassing myself. I have people who are looking at me wondering what in the heck I'm doing. Uh, but anyway, we've done some videos here at the show of shows before, and it's absolutely incredible. So there's a lot of dealers here and a lot of collectors, but really, it's almost like a giant museum in a way, and I always learn something while I'm here. So, so we're gonna walk the floor, we're gonna link up with Eric, and uh, see what's here at the show of shows this year and uh, see what we can learn. I'm here with my good friend Bill Shea of the Ruptured Duck. He's been on the channel before and we've done a lot of business. Longtime friend and I always say if you, if you can't get it at the Gettysburg Museum of History, go to the Ruptured Duck if we don't have it. But Bill was just telling me an amazing story and I just thought that you know, the viewers of the channel might really enjoy this. So, Bill, why don't you take it from here? I, I just thought this was an incredible story. Thanks very much. I had the unbelievable opportunity to interact with a Marine uh, who uh, volunteers at a uh, VA, and he volunteered to help uh, a w woman uh, replace the floor in an apartment in Philadelphia. And when they were pulling up the floorboards, they found two copies of the Sunday Star, Washington, D.C., dated April 22nd, 1945, with the most incredible and famous picture of World War II, which is the raising of the flag on Iwo Jima. This happens to be signed by two of the flag raisers. We have Ira Hayes and Renee Gagnon. What a piece of history. Underneath the floorboard on an apartment in Philadelphia, being used as ballast and I was able to purchase them and I've decided I will never part with one and here is the other one. What an incredible story and you know Renee uh, died I believe. Ira Hayes or, or Ira, Ira, Ira Hayes died. These guys went around on a bond drive and, and they were signing autographs and so something like this is just incredibly rare and Bill thank you so much for sharing that story it's just a really great piece always a pleasure so while we are on the topic of Iwo Jima I wanted to show this other artifact that Bill has out on display which is just absolutely incredible uh, this is a very rare uh, restricted Iwo Jima planning map uh, the story is that this was found uh, on the inside of a 4th Marine Division history book and uh, belonged to a guy whose nickname was Chicken. And what really makes this map exceptionally cool is that it was signed by a bunch of the guys who had fought in the battle. So most likely what's going on here is that after the battle was over, uh, the men who survived the fighting there uh, signed this for their buddy. And uh, yeah, you can see some of the details on there. But wow, that is absolutely incredible. All right, now here is an example of some of the wild stuff that you will see at this show. Now I am unfamiliar with this gun. Uh, it says that it's a Swiss Solo Thern. But anyway, it's a, uh, a 20 millimeter gun. And look at the Daggum magazine for this thing. Like that is absolutely ridiculous. Huh. All right, now uh, I'm not the only one who is here today. Uh, we also have Chris Langwall back here, who is the grandson of Eugene Rowe from Easy Company. 
Uh, he's written some great books for kids. Uh, we also have Matt Leach back here, who played Floyd Talbert in Band of Brothers. Of course, Eric is here. And then also Andrew Biggio, author of The Rifle and The Rifle 2, and someone who was in The Rifle 2 and in a few of the videos on History Traveler, uh, Ed Cottrell, who's a World War II veteran, 102 years old right now, by the way, uh, who was a P-47 pilot. So anyway, yeah, I got lots going on here today. All right, Matt. For, oh, first, first time at the show of shows, right? First time at the show of shows, buddy. What, what, uh, what do you think so far? It is a very interesting slice of Americana I never knew existed, JD. <laughs> uh, slightly mind blown, uh, slightly in awe, <laughs> slightly scared. But come on down, it's fantastic. <laughs> Hey, what what uh, what are some of the things you got going on, like with uh, We Happy Few and the tour and stuff like oh, that? Oh right, okay. So as you know, we partnered up with um, Eric Dorr from the Gettysburg Museum of History. So we're here just kind of uh, selling our wares, which is the two-week tour. So it's uh, it's a legacy tour. So it's the path of Easy Company. So it starts in Oldbourne in England. We do Normandy for four days. We go down and do Market Garden, then of course Bastogne, then Hanging Out, and we end up in Earth Discard. And it goes out May 6th to May 18th. This is our maiden voyage. Um, we don't have a lot of places left, but if you're interested, you can go on to a, the website, or you can call the Gettysburg Museum of History, speak to Becky, who speaks better English than I do, and uh, she'll sort you out. So that's what I'm doing here. Also, uh, sign in a few things. Uh, Chris Langlois here, which is Doc Rowe's grandson. He's, uh, he's signing a book that apparently he wrote himself, um, although I definitely help with the spelling. <laughs> he's got three different books, so yeah, we're just, we're just here doing our do, brother. All right, now uh, Matt just mentioned Chris Langwall and some of the books that he has written. And here's the man himself, so grandson Good of, to see you again. Uh, yeah. Hey, uh, tell me about this uh, most recent book that you got. So, Drafty marches with the Band of Brothers. So along the way, um, Colonel Sink marched 2nd Battalion of the 506 after their uh, training in Tokoa to Atlanta, trying to beat a Japanese world record. And along their way, they met a little stray dog and they named him Drafty. And so Drafty tells the story of the march from his point of view. So a kind of cool little angle to, to get kids interested in World War II and, and who doesn't love dogs? Everyone loves dogs, right? Kids love dogs. Yeah. So just a neat way to kind of introduce history and, and, and the brotherhood and the service that these guys did from a dog's point of view. Awesome. Ed, how was that Chick-fil-A? Pretty good. It was pretty good? <laughs> Went down pretty good. <laughs> hey, uh, when uh, when you were flying P-47s back in the war, did you ever think that all these years later people would be so interested in, in what you guys did over there? Had no idea. Had never even gave it a thought what would happen 80 years later. Huh. And actually until the last it's only been the last five years for me, because uh, until you turn a hundred, you're just one of, you know, for a while there was one of uh, a million and, you know, now they're down to 150. And once you turn a hundred, people begin to want to talk to you and <laughs> think you're something different. And I'm not, I'm just lucky. Yeah, and you're 102 right now, 102. right? 102. 102, that is phenomenal. Yeah. And still going strong. So far. <laughs> but uh, no, I never gave it a thought. Now, this is something that will always catch my eye. Uh, this is a Rupert uh, dummy paratrooper that was used on D-Day. Uh, we've shown these before, or one of these before, at the Gettysburg Museum of History, but they're pretty rare, so it's worth mentioning again. Uh, these were, uh, of course, dummy parachutes that were dropped on D-Day to try and uh, mislead the Germans. And yeah, they have one here at the show of shows. I'm here with Dave Wyatt. He's an old friend of mine. We've done a lot of business together. He sold stuff to the Gettysburg Museum of History. He's an absolute expert on medals and badges. And he's launching a new website called empirespast.com. And uh, 
He's going to be selling some really high-end stuff. Um, of course, always come to the Gettysburg Museum of History website first, and then if we don't have it, go see Dave. But he's going to tell us about an extremely rare uh, metal today, and uh, I'll let Dave take it from here. This is an early Junker 800 Knight's Cross. These are one of the earliest Knight's Crosses that Junker had produced in the Iron Core. Uh, the, the, the very first Junker Knight's Crosses were actually made with a, with a non-ferrous core, and that's a non-magnetic core. And sometime in 1940, Adolf Hitler said that all Knight's Crosses needed to be produced with an iron core, so that's when Junker went over to these, these iron core types. And they're the first 800. So the first type is an 800 dot. This is the second type, sometime in, in the late 1940. So it's a very early cross. 800 is underneath of the eyelet. Most commonly these Knight's Crosses are seen with, with marks like L12 or, or the Lazy 2 that everybody knows and that's next to the 800 silver stamp. But these early ones, during that time frame, 1940, there was not a whole lot of Knight's Cross winners. Uh, so these, these crosses are quite rare. So, pretty much the Knight's Cross was the Medal of Honor for the German military. and. To get this, you had to, it, it, just like the Medal of Honor, it would go through the ranks until eventually it got to Adolf Hitler himself and he would, he would approve or deny it. When you were awarded this award a second time, you would then get what was called the oak leaves. And the oak leaves replaced just the loop. If it was a third time, they'd add swords to it. A fourth time, they, it's, it was pretty much, it's a, it's a much different design. Well, it's the same design, but it's, it's now would be in platinum or, or white gold and encrusted with diamonds. And then there was the fifth type, which was the golden oak leaf swords and diamonds, and that was only awarded one time to, to Rudel sometime in 1944. All right, so I'm uh, making my way through the show here, and uh, I'm at the booth of Advance Guard Militaria, and uh, some of this trench art from World War I really caught my eye because I really like trench art, but check this out. Uh, now this is just cool as heck to me. Uh, these are like cow bones that have been carved up and fashioned into pieces of art. Uh, to the best of my understanding, these were done by German POWs in England. Uh, well, as a matter of fact, if we look right there, let me get a better angle. There you can see something that says uh, made by uh, Bulgar, prisoner of war, 1917. But there are just all kinds of these uh, pieces of trench art through here. Decent chance that old JD is going to be walking away with one of those. Here are a few more World War I pieces that really caught my eye. Uh, these look to be maybe pieces of propeller that were fashioned into photo frames uh, or, or maybe they were just photo frames that were made to look like a propeller. Honestly, I don't know. And then you can see the veterans in there. Got a little skull and crossbones going on with this one. I don't know what that's all about. Uh, whether this person was killed or whether it's just to look mean. Uh, and then here's another one that caught my eye. A little photo frame made out of uh, metal and bullets. Yeah, all kinds of cool stuff. All right, so we're walking around uh, show of shows and you never know when you're going to run into some famous people. <laughs> and look at here, <laughs> we got uh, Joey up? from Snafu Docks and also Flo back here, uh, battlefield guide, and also appears on Snafu Docks. And uh, they picked up something. All right, so I got this uh, long, long yard from uh, guys of L Company of a regiment of the 84th Division. We don't know which regiment, but I thought it was so cool. Uh, and for 50 bucks, I couldn't just let it stay here. And I have to, I have to take it home now with me. Yep, pretty cool. As you can see guys with the 84th Division patch. Pretty neat. And there's a veteran, of course, from the 84th here. It was in K Company and not L Company. Nice. Alright, 
so walking the hall here and uh, just had another piece that caught my eye from World War I. Uh, this is a set of armor uh, from World War I. So this was kind of more of an experimental thing. And um, there's actually a helmet that is with this. And uh, a helmet by itself is not going to stop a bullet. So uh, this was kind of another experimental thing where they got this reinforcement on the front to, uh, to hopefully stop any bullets. But yeah, that's, uh, that's really interesting. All right, now this is really kind of neat. Uh, I recently saw something in the news where uh, they thought they may have found a plane that could be Amelia Earhart's. Uh, well, here's a photograph of Amelia Earhart and also her signature. Yeah, that's pretty wild. So a collector contacted me recently about a really unique artifact and um, I immediately thought of this guy right here. This is Andrew Biggio, author of The Rifle. And um, Andy has done a lot of good for World War II memory and our veterans. And one of the things that was really amazing to me is he put up a plaque for a soldier that was killed from his hometown, uh, Boston, Massachusetts, named uh, Joseph Madonna. And uh, he took me there back in March, and JD as well, um, and we stopped at the little, little house in Foy, or Foy, and uh, he told us about it, and there was a plaque there. And um, I initially was going to get this for the Gettysburg Museum of History, but I can't think of anyone more deserving of this unique yep. artifact than the man that put up the plaque, and now it's stuck in this bag. I know so exactly what this this. Yeah, this I, I, I kind of leaked it a little bit. Yeah. Here, you get it out. Yeah. Um, well, I'm familiar with these two, thanks to you. You know, these... Um, do you want to say what it is? So, yeah, these can be a little controversial if you don't know exactly what they are. And what it is is a temporary grave plaque. And they, they would make these... Um, for the wood crosses. Now all these guys were reburied or repatriated back to the U.S. And um, but this is Joseph Madonna's original grave plaque, and it was found years ago in Belgium with a bunch of other ones. And um, you know it's not grave robbing; it was it was discarded. But um, this gentleman here put up a monument to this guy, and I just think you should have this because it's it's just an, an incredibly. Um, I guess emotional piece for you because of the hometown connection. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about sure. Joseph Madonna? Sure. Um, so it's weird how life comes full cir circle, and it's just not a coincidence. It's, there's something more powerful out there to to do this. But um, starting off in my career in law enforcement and living, I live in the town of Winthrop, Massachusetts, which is a small suburb of Boston, where I also worked as a police officer. I did a lot of maintaining the local town squares named after those who were KIA from our town, which was almost 50, including my uncle, Andrew Biggio. Well, I always noticed, you know, uh, a crooked sign that was had damage from, you know, weather and years of being in place, and it was for a young man named Joe Madonna. And I went and I looked up who Joe Madonna was and saw that he was buried in Luxembourg, and at the time I was bringing a group of Winthrop police officers for the 75th anniversary of uh, the Battle of the Bulge, and we actually got to visit Joe Madonna's grave, a local kid who graduated Winthrop High School, class of 1938. Great football star, great track star, uh, very athletic, and um, had a lot going for him. Well, uh, he actually earned the Silver Star uh, during the Battle of the Bulge, and then ended up being killed uh, a few days later, coming out of a doorway in the town of Foy, or Foy, as most people over there would call it. Um, Joe Madonna, who at the time was a staff sergeant, um, he might have been posthum posthumously promoted, but um, he came out of a, a doorway which was being used as an aid station and the uh, Germans had set up an MG42 and shot him. Uh, he was with I Company 506 and the bullets ricocheted off the door jam and hit him in the temple. And I think it was Reg Jans who told me, I know exactly where that house is, the battle damage on that house is still there. You can still see the bullet holes. I said, that's amazing. I'm replacing the old sign in Winthrop where it says Joe Madonna Square. I'd like to place, take 
the new sign, leave it in Winthrop and take the old original sign placed in front of his house and put it at the house he was killed in. We made contact with the old lady who lived there, who actually lived through the war, she was in her 80s, and agreed to put this sign on her house in Foy. And so if you go to Foy today, you'll see Joe Madonna Square attached to the same home in the doorway he was killed in with the bullet holes around it. And for me to have this um, is a sign from Joe to have a piece of his legacy and his history. And um, thank you very much. So this is You're huge welcome. and I appreciate that. Like I said, I can't think of anybody more deserving than the man that placed the monument there. Yeah. You know? And uh, I'm, I'm glad to give it to and, you. And uh, this, this kid had a lot going for him, you know. He yeah. was, uh, uh, his his downstairs neighbor is still alive. He's a Korean War Marine in his 90s, and he would clean Joe Madonna's cleats after the football games at Winthrop, and told me all about Joe Madonna. So I'm going to show him this. His name's Vincent Bronya, and he's still alive. I think he's in his mid 90s now. So thank you. Yeah. just got back from the show of shows we had a very successful show this is why we go every year we picked up quite a few items as you can see um, now most of these items are for a website you know we resell certain items we go out and buy them and then we resell them to raise money for the museum but we also got a couple of really interesting pieces that are that are for the museum so I wanted to show you those um, one of the things that I, I always look for is uh, five or six items especially second battalion and I found this incredible um, 506 second battalion helmet liner and I'm sorry I'm not wearing gloves I forgot them um, but uh, it, this has the second battalion tick mark on the spade you can also see it was painted twice and whatever collector had this in the 1970s put shellac on it unfortunately this is a Westinghouse liner which is the later version meaning it would have been operation market garden or later it does have a laundry tag in it or a laundry stamp so I will research it I did um, find out the provenance of this and it was in two very prominent collections and then a very prominent dealer had it at the show so I decided to buy it I only know of a handful of truly authentic versions of the 506 2nd Battalion helmets we have a complete one um, but I wanted to get this other version I mean every one is different so this was quite a find I was very excited and it was it was a nice surprise to find this at the show now this is part of a uh, plane I haven't research which type it is but I believe it might be an ME 109 this is the tail section I believe and, and one went down and a, and a American soldier cut it out and what's really interesting it's in great shape usually these are scratched up when, when we get them but this one has a really cool message on here and it says to Betty from Uncle Tommy April 20th 1945 so he sent this home to someone in his family, his niece, apparently. And uh, interestingly enough, April 20th is Hitler's birthday. So this plane went down on that date, and uh, or it was sent back at that time. I assume maybe it's the crash. Um, another thing I wanted to talk about real quick was this. Now, this is a 101st Airborne Chalice. Now, this was made out of one of Hermann Goering's hunting cups. Each one of these was different. This one was from 1936, and they would make a... a the, the skull with the antlers of whatever animal he killed on that hunt. So I've seen a couple of these and each one is slightly different. Now what happened was this was captured at the end of World War II up in the uh, Berchtesgaden area and the 101st Airborne repurposed these as uh, trophies, trophy cups for different officers in the 101st Airborne. Now we've talked a little bit before about the famous sink cup. This is one for the higher division officers so this is for officers that are not in the 506 now there's three different versions of these from the 101st airborne um, three different styles and we're going to later on do an in-depth video on the three different types and what they mean but that was a great surprise to find that today or yesterday at the show now another great item that we are going to keep this is major general jim gavin's coffee thermos <laughs> kind of a bizarre item but 
Jim Gavin loved coffee, and he had to have it. Now, Jim Gavin was the commander of the 82nd Airborne in World War II. Kind of a famous guy. They called him Jumpin' Jim. So in here, you have the thermos, and he kept his coffee in here. It was probably pretty high-tech at the time. Um, whether this is really World War II or maybe a little bit after, I'm not sure. I'll have to research it a little bit. But it came from his estate. Many of his items were sold after his death. It's kind of interesting. It has his two stars there and it has his name. Another keeper for the museum. You know, we have Jim Gavin's uniform at the museum. So I was very happy to get that piece. All right. I'm going to back up here and take a look at this massive pile of artifacts like every year it just never ceases to amaze me what comes out of this show uh, now for just a second uh, let's talk about nazi stuff now some people might look at uh, you know nazi flags and armbands and things like that and really kind of be creeped out by it and i get it uh, but keep in mind there is a reason that all of this stuff is lying on a bed in a hotel in Louisville, Kentucky, and not in Germany. And that is because the Allies won and the Axis powers lost. So, so when you're looking at this, what you're looking at is really a symbol of Allied victory in World War II. And take a look at this. Uh, I've been in the homes of several veterans, and in their study or in their basement, uh, they have the flags of the you know the, the captured flags uh, from the Germans hanging in their home because they were proud of it. And you take a look at these photos right here. You can see uh, these different veterans who are displaying their trophies. Here's one. Uh, wow, that one is really interesting. I hadn't even taken a close look at that yet. It says Bob and Oscar and the Dogs, uh, November the 5th, 1944. And here there's like a Hitler youth flag and the regular Nazi banner. You can see a German uh, officer's visor there. And, um, you know, again, this is a, a celebration of victory. All right, here's another one. You can see this is from a veteran of the 45th Infantry Division. And all, they've cut the roundel out of the middle of this Nazi flag, and all of the guys have signed it. Okay, so again, when, when you're looking at, at some of these items, don't think of it as a celebration of the party or the ideology or of Hitler, uh, but rather a celebration of the fact that, uh, that we won. One of the items I always look for at these shows is authentic Third Reich silver. Um, they're in high demand on the website. People are asking me for it all the time. So we did find a couple of nice pieces. We found a gravy boat from the Reich Chancellery, um, a tray, um, some, some flatware. Um, but this one's really unique. Th this is an Adolf Hitler marked cigar cutter. And this is made in the informal pattern. It has a cutter on here. And um, they made it in both the informal pattern, such as this, and the formal, which is a little bit more fancy. Now, Hitler didn't smoke. Most people know that, or a lot of people know that. But he would bring out smoker sets, you know, cigar box and, and, and lighters, and it was on a tray for his guests. And they would have the cigar cutter usually on that tray. So this is a pretty rare piece. I haven't seen one for sale in a long time. But... Um, you know, we're, we're, this will be for sale on our website only because we, we are looking for a formal pattern um, and this is the informal because the formal pattern will go better with the smoking set that we have in our collection. Another item I, I've been looking for for a long time is an SS helmet cover and um, you see these at the show sometimes. Some of these were found after the war. A lot of vets didn't bring these home. They just wanted the helmet so they ripped these right off. Um, so a lot of the ones you see that are actually authentic are n almost mint, never used. What I wanted was a combat used one, one that had wear to it, honest wear, that actually was worn. Um, so we have a, a mannequin of a Waffen SS soldier and we really needed one of these for that mannequin. So I finally got one that I was happy with that has the proper wear and tear on it to do a, a, a good combat medic. Or, um, good combat mannequin. Um, so 
that was a great find. I also got a couple other pieces of insignia that will go in the collection. Some of this will be for sale, but um, you know we, we collect SS insignia, so we got a couple cuff titles and boards and uh, a few other items. So again, a, a great haul at the, at the show of shows. We found a lot of items and um, real happy with, with the outcome here. And um, you know, you'll see some of it on the website and some of, some of it at the museum. So uh, let's take a look at a few of the things that old JD picked up. Uh, now I have some signed Japanese flags already, but this one was a little bit unique. Eric has a few like this, but I did not. Where it has these child handprints on it. So uh, a lot of the kanji that you see are either signatures or are uh, messages, you know, for the, the soldier wishing good luck or good fortune in war. Uh, but if a child could not write their own name, well, they would get ink on their hands or paint on their hands, and then that's how they would sign it. So that was one of the things that I picked up today. And also picked up this right here. Uh, this is obviously an M1 helmet. Uh, the insignia that you see there is uh, painted on from the 3rd Marine Division. Uh, now, the, the strap here uh, is like a, a post-war uh, edition. So, even though it looks newer compared to uh, the helmet, that, well, that's why. But anyway, uh, those are a few of the things that I uh, picked up today. Well, uh, that is going to wrap up our time here at the Show of Shows. Uh, if you've never been to this thing, it is amazing. They have it annually. And it, again, like I said, it's like a giant museum uh, where you can actually buy some of the stuff. So anyway, uh, we are going to go ahead and uh, shut this thing off and go get something to eat because I have not had anything all day long. <laughs>